You're traveling into another dimension. A wondrous journey deep into a pop culture realm that has influenced generations of fans and filmmakers. An examination of the work and influence of a man named Rod Serling. An exploration we call Deep in the Zone. Hey, it's David Levin, and welcome to our deep dive into episode by episode of The Twilight Zone. Today, we are doing Penny for Your Thoughts, Thoughts starring Dick York. And so, to uh, make it a really special occasion, I've invited my friend Herbie J. Pilato back to the podcast, videocast. What do you call this? I don't know. Uh, Herbie, welcome back. Thank you. And Very nice to be here, as always, David. You're the best. Uh, no, you are. Herbie J. has uh, written numerous books. Uh, Mary Tyler Moore story. Was it Mary the Mary Tyler Moore story? Right. And uh, what you see up there, Twitch Upon a Star, and of course, one of my favorite books, which I have two of here, uh, Bewitched Forever. Uh, this is the ultimate guide, I think, to Bewitched, and it's got all sorts of, it's the immortal companion to television's most magical super, I love this book. I love this book. I had two of them on my shelf, um, and uh, it's just, it's really fun to read. Lots of great information. You know, there's this other one that a lot of people don't know about, The Essential Elizabeth Montgomery, which is an encyclopedia of Elizabeth's work, and I talk about... Um, um, the episodes that she did at Twilight Zone in this, as well as in this one. So this started out as an index to this book, uh -huh. but in Herbie, your book is too big. Can you make a second book? So that's how that happened. Oh my God, that's great. That is great. Well, welcome to the show. Today we are going to be talking about a great episode with uh, which stars Dick York. It's not the first episode of the Twilight Zone that he appeared on. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about that when we get in, and we will be doing that other episode at another time. Um, but today's episode is a lighter episode. Last week we watched um, The Invaders with Agnes Moorhead and this time Dick York doing a, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a slightly lighter tone, wouldn't you say? Yes, and who she adored, by the way. She adored Dick York. And Dora may have not liked Darren on, on TV, but Agnes Moorhead adored Dick York. It was a mutual uh, admiration society, apparently. The two of them were crazy oh, about each other. She had a tremendous uh, respect for his talent as an actor. And, you know, she was very, like I said last time, highfalutin. So she didn't, her standards are very high. And she just adored him. Uh, anything before we get started? Uh, otherwise, I'll just, uh, we, we'll, we'll, we'll just dive into the episode. And again, for those of you who have not watched before, there are spoilers ahead, and the one thing you don't want if you're watching The Twilight Zone for the first time are spoilers. So please go watch go watch the episode on Netflix or on Hulu or wherever you can find it. Amazon, it's everywhere practically. Um, uh, uh, Paramount Plus, not CBS Plus anymore. Uh, so go watch this episode. And Herbie, Jay... We are going to uh, go back into the show and enter the Twilight Zone. That was good. You're traveling through another dimension. Of course you are. A dimension not only of sight and sound, but of mind. A journey into a wondrous land whose boundaries are that of imagination. That's the signpost up ahead. Your next stop, the Twilight Zone. Not only did he change the visuals, but he also changed the, the narratives, too. Several times, yeah. Paper, 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 get your cassette. Paper, paper, get your paper, late sports final. Ooh. This must be your lucky day, mister. That'll never happen again in a million years. And there he is. Dick York, looking like your average everyday man, you know, good looking, but not too good looking, a little, a little dorky looking, I guess, with his big ears, but, right? Yeah, and he looks like Darren here, he's dressed up like an ad guy, so yes. it's like a precursor. Yes, he is. Um, so interestingly, well, so, so this was written by George Clayton jo uh, Johnson, who became one of the, 
one of the writers who wrote a bunch of scripts for the Twilight Zone, some of the more memorable ones. And here we go. He's he now just, just yeah, in, in an early version of the script, this car accident was supposed to really um, be the, the the ignition for him to start hearing his thoughts. The coin thing or hearing others' thoughts. The right. coin thing came later. But he was supposed to now, because he got hit, now start hearing the thoughts. But that's not really why. You can't know how sorry I am. They have to decide what's the gimmick going to be. Is it going to be the toy classes or going to be the get hit by a car? I mean, come on. F figure it out. Superman didn't come from Earth and then get hit with radiation. I mean, it's just pick one. It's true. <laughs> Are you certain you're all right, sir? I, I, I think so. You know, I think we need to put this into context also, this thing about supernatural powers and stuff like that. Now we've got a bazillion shows and movies where weird stuff happens to ordinary people. This was it for years. You know, nothing like this was on the air. Nothing. This is so groundbreaking. And by the way, there's Mr. Serling right there on the set, uh, right behind the uh, newsstand. Not smoking a cigarette. He's just holding a, a coin. Nice, nice. And this was the, this appears, originally appeared um, one week after The Invaders with Correct. Andrew Smart. Yeah? Correct. The, the intro Nine, ten, of that show or the preview yeah. um, of this show on at the end of The Invaders. Interesting. Now, you know, people, you were saying how, oh, this guy, love this guy, Dan Tobin. Yes. He actually guest starred in an episode of Bewitched where Andorra puts a spell on Darren to remember everything. And he's always talking, always talking, always talking. And Dan Tobin plays a client of Darren's at McMahon and Tate. He's at Samantha and Darren's house and he says to his wife, do I really go on and on and on like he does? <laughs> but, you know, you had mentioned before how Darren or Dick York yep. is good looking but not good looking. And the truth of the matter is, he was a good looking guy. Look at, wait till he sees his head again. Look yes. at that hairline. Can you please on that on his hairline? Yeah, or sure. Give me a second. We'll get there a second. Oh. Oops. Let me see if I can find a better look at his hairline. Well, that was a good one. Right? Right there. Yeah. Well, look at it. I mean, that is an amazing hairline. And he kept that hairline. Yeah. You know, right into the day he died, which is very early, you know, from yeah. emphysema. And, and that was just horrible. He was sick. He had a lot of, he had a lot of uh, issues, his back issues and. Back issues. He, he hurt his back in a film working on a film called They Came From Cordura, where he was working on a railroad cart in one scene. You know, those mm -hmm. old railroad Right, cart. right, right. And he was, another actor was with him, and the director yelled, cut. The other actor let go, and he didn't. And he <gasps> wrenched his back. Oh, gosh. And he never recovered from that, and he became, you know, he started taking painkillers, and he started taking them on, on Bewitched, and he would miss episodes. It was horrible. Yeah. Nobody wanted to get rid of Dick York on Bewitched. They they just had it, didn't have a choice. But anyway, so look at this guy. He's a good-looking guy. He is. He is. But he's got those ears. You know, he's like, look, he's attractive, but he you don't feel like he's so good-looking that he's unapproachable. You know what I mean? There's like an every like like the best of the Twilight Zones. He's he's got an everyman approachability to him. Yes. Yes, yes. And, you know, he had been acting since he was 15 years old in radio yeah. with his wife, by the way. That's how they met in radio and uh, they, they stayed married forever. Um, but he had an amazing, amazing resume. And I remember him telling me that when he auditioned for Bewitched, he jumped on Elizabeth Montgomery's lap and says, Aren't we cute together? You gotta hire me. And he said that's how, that's how he got all his jobs. So when I'm I'm seeing him audition for this, I'm like, did he jump on Dan Tobin's lap and say, Aren't we cute together? You gotta hire me. I know this is a funny this is a funny bit that the director put in. 
where he yeah. listens and he stops. And she's not thinking anything. And he comes back again. No, for... thought. no thought in her mind. Yes, we have to understand, uh, we've been talking so much, that this man is, is hearing everybody's thoughts. Right. The, the magic coin or whatever happened at the beginning. I think it's the to... combination. I Mr. think. Up oh, and look at this. We now yeah, have worlds colliding. Yes. Dr. Yes. Bellows yes. from yes. Yes. I yes. Dream of Genie is here with yes. Dick York, two of the non-magic characters, and here they are on screen together. The are also that the check is made out. Certainly, Mr. Brand. Loved Won't you sit down? Rourke. Say that again. That I loved Hayden Rourke. Hayden York is. And by the way, Hayden Rourke's house, Dr. Bellows' house. I and I, Jim McGenie, was Samantha's house, redressed. I just think it was in the same development. The same architect built the, built it. Yes, no, clearly it was the same set. But I remember as a kid going, oh, my God, the Bellows live in, in, the, in the Stevens house. It, it yeah. Was, yeah, that was, you know, um, I was interviewed. You got, uh, Brian's song. Yes. Well, you know, uh, Screen Gems in Columbia did a lot of those. They they tried, They tried. saved money wherever they could, as did everybody. Right. If you look at a lot of sets back then, uh, people were all... But that one was what, you know, to, to use a set that was so familiar on something else uh, was... was um, a mistake. <laughs> a mistake, yes. Well, I remember in an episode of Bewitched, Salem was basically... Uh, um, Seattle from Here Come the Brides. Oh, yes. Yes, which I loved. Another show I loved. Another show I loved also. So now, when, when you, you watch can... Dick here, the way he holds his, his body, I mean, he's he's relatively conservative or reserved. Yeah. Uh, he's, you know, it's not as wild. But he doesn't become wild so much in Bewitched because of the character but rather because he plays the same role and i think that happens a lot with actors that they feel more comfortable physically if they're doing either a stage play over time or a regular gig on a series but usually you'll see actors in one shot guest spots looking different or playing the physicality different because they're not really familiar with how that character is supposed to move because they don't play them every week interesting now, what do we know about this um, this actress, June? Not a whole uh, lot? She was a stock actress, you know, very... Uh, I don't think she was really ever as matronly as she appeared here. Yeah. For some reason, they wanted her to be dowdy because that's the character. Um, but, yeah, she, she was around forever. You didn't see a bad actor on this show, whether no. it was a supporting or a lead because everybody was trained. Yeah. Everybody just didn't do a video on YouTube and get a series. Hey, let's not let's let's got not get snarky. <laughs> <laughs> I've done a video on YouTube. I you know, I mean it's like it's nothing. I different. have videos on YouTube. I'm talking about untrained people, okay, who just automatically just show up and then they get a series. Um okay. I, I, I understand. The, the interesting thing about this, and people talk all the time about the big actors who did the show, and then, you know, every now and then you will see, and this is not one of those episodes, but every now and then you will see a supporting uh, actor or person and just sort of a very minor, I mean, people, people, people know about Robert Redford and Jack Klugman and some of these other people yeah. who are huge, but then every now and then you'll see somebody in the background, like, you know, in a very early episode, Ted Knight appeared uh, as just a practically an uncredited uh, character in um, with Jack Warden, um, and that's the cool thing about some of these shows. Now I know for a lot of people who are sort of growing up today, who who didn't grow up like we did, or even people who were who were a little younger than us. Um, you look and you say, oh, my God, I know that guy. I know that character. I know that, you know, these character actors. So now this guy here um, was in Mary Poppins and was in a lot of shows, including, I think, Bewitched, and a lot of shows in the 60s yeah. and did a, several episodes. Um, do you remember his name? I have it written down, but do you remember his name? And, and some I, of the... I do not remember his name. All right, I'm going to look it up in my handy-dandy book by our Great friend book. Mark Zakri. 
terrific it's book. because of that book and uh, the world of Star Trek that I went on to write the Bewitched books. Those books inspired me. Cyril Delavanti. Yeah. And uh, yeah. Cyril Delavanti did a ton of stuff. Um, and he was one of those actors who you would see every now and then. And, he had, and he'll, he'll come back again later. He has a way of speaking that you recognize it right away, you know, in a certain kind of... And the, the, the other thing was character actors sometimes only played one kind of character. Some of the actors would, you know, have a, a wide range. People, like we said last week, Agnes Moorhead. Then others would just play a certain part. Charles Lane was one of those guys yeah. who just played one kind of part. And lived and lived forever, like into his hundreds. Yeah. But, you know, now with Dick York, Dick York and Elizabeth Montgomery, for that matter, both did so much. And they were, you know, well-executed roles. They weren't just bit parts. They He, he did like over, I don't know, 100 guest spots yeah. or something uh, because he was so good. Um, well, they had troops. They had troops. I need somebody who can do this and step in and just do it. And so you got those guys, and they, and those guys were out there, and you knew you could, and you would see those people should they show up as a as a as a client or as a murderer, as a victim on a Perry Mason or on a judge for the defense or on, you know, some other Alfred Hitchcock, Alfred Hitchcock you know, all these different shows, and it was almost like a, a repertory company. Um, and especially, you know, during the 50s when, when Sterling really cut his teeth on, on the Playhouse 90s and some of these other anthology shows that are no longer with us, really. Now we just get movies uh, and, you know, miniseries. But, but back then, it was like every week you'd get a brand new play presented live on network. And that's, what, that's where, you know, Sterling really learned his craft. Uh, Amazing. And, you know, the great thing, too, about Dick York here is that he, uh, he th th this this role is like he's under a spell. Yep. You know, <laughs> put him under a spell where he can read people's minds. And, again, they took that one idea of it, and he just flew with it. You know what I mean? It was some, It was one idea, okay, I can read everybody's mind, and he flew with it, just like he would fly with uh, whatever he was, you know, if he was conceited, He'd be consistently conceded throughout every episode of The Witch, or uh, every every moment of that episode. Yeah. If he had to remember everything like he did in that episode with Dan Tobin, right. then he'd re It was he took it and he, he focused on it and he excelled at it. And he played it. He played it straight. He didn't play it for laughs, but it came out hilarious. Uh, do you think this this episode had anything to do with the fact that that he got the part he got on Bewitched? I know I William William it. William Asher did direct. Uh, some Twilight Zone as well. Yeah, he, he directed one with Carol Burnett, right. I believe. Yeah, and Carol Burnett, as it turned out, was would end up being a very good friend to Elizabeth Montgomery. But Bill Asher was more a comedy director. That's why he directed that one episode of of Zone, which is comedic. Which was supposed uh, to be a spinoff, also, I think. Yeah, 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 yeah. And uh, he did a film called Johnny Cool, which is where he met Elizabeth, and it was a drama. It's not one of my best or my favorite movies of Bill's uh, because it's a drama and his talent was in comedy. You know, just like Stanley Kramer, the best director ever when it comes to, uh, oh, guess who's coming to dinner? It's one of my favorite movies right, of all right. time. But Mad, Mad World, I'm sorry. I know that it has a whole, huge cult following. I just think it's one of the... One of the worst movies ever made. I'm you sorry. You know, Mad Mad World, I liked it when I was 10. I uh, watched it again recently. It, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a little dated. Sorry. It's a little well, there's, dated. There's no, he, it, the pacing is completely off. Yeah. It's just there's, because he did not know how to direct comedy. So here we are watching a drama with an actor who could do both comedy and drama but he balanced it in such a way that he made it real just like there's comedy and drama in real life not everybody's just always laughing all the time in real life and not right. everybody's always crying in real right life. everybody has a, a little of both a, a regular healthy per healthy-minded person does so that's what these characters are on the twilight zone real people in unreal situations but believable 
credible within that world, whatever it was, as long as it was explained logistically, you believed it in that world. Yes. Which is why The Witch was so popular is because whatever happened in that world made sense. The yep. logic within the illogic, same thing here. Yeah. Yeah. With all the Twilight Zone. Uh, again, interesting, and people watch The Twilight Zone now, and, you know, there are so many things about... Okay, I'll give you a quick example. When I was in eighth grade, we studied a little bit. We did uh, Romeo and Juliet. Okay, we, we, st we were studying Shakespeare. And we were... And it was right around the time that West Side Story first appeared on TV. So we sort of matched the two of them together. And one day our teacher said, well, what do you think of Romeo and Juliet? And one kid raised his hand and he said, well, I like it, but it's got so many cliches in it. And... You know, it's like Shakespeare wrote those cliches. Well, there were so many things now from the Twilight Zone that seem dated or cliched. Oh, by the way, here's his here's his his character, and he's like, "Where's that idiot fool?" Yeah, that that, that character was this character is great, but but everything was cl is cliche now. You know, you can almost guess the twist endings. Although in this particular case, there's not a twist ending. It's just sort of uh, spoiler alert. It's just kind of a happy ending, but um. But Twilight Zone created those cliches. Twilight, they weren't cliches when the Twilight Zone did them. Right. And, and the style of acting from this show was the style of acting at the time. And so you have to take it in the context of what it was and enjoy it. For what... I think it was a better acting, though, David. I don't think it okay. was... I don't think it was as stilted as most... Um, TV shows and movies still were at the time. Let's take a moment. I want to say, just listen I, to this bit of dialogue. This I actor, I love the way he speaks. How did you know? How did you know, Mr. Poole? It's true, of course. I was thinking of filling my briefcase with the bank's money. Yes. It's a little dream of mine. Have you ever had a dream, Mr. Poole? I have. And this is... This is this is, uh, it may have been written by, by uh, George Clayton Johnson, but it just, it sounds like uh, like Rod Serling was doing a little bit of editing, story editing here. Yeah, 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 yeah. Got that part. Yes, just a pool. Yes. But I'll never go through with it. You know what? I've lived with it too long. I'm old and set in my ways. You and see besides, how, Mr. Poole. You see how Dick York is not overdoing any responses? Yep. He's just standing there listening, which is what a good actor does. Instead of trying to steal every scene they're in, he, gi he gives to the other actor in this scene. Yep. yep, and he just takes a moment to, he's about to say something, and then he moves on, and then he's about to say something to her. You know... When I was single and growing up, I would have given anything to have to be able to know what some of those girls were thinking. Well, I'm sure they all thought you were wonderful. Oh, I'm sure they did, but I, you know, I need I needed to know for sure. It's 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 you know it look it's it's the other thing is there's a charm to this episode. It's not scary. It's not spooky. It's just charming. It's sweet. Well, you know what? <clears throat> that is a key word. Charming and likability. Okay? That was so important in television. It's, it's important today, which, again, I don't mean to attack so much television today. <laughs> you have a point a of view. You have a key point of view. <laughs> I don't see a lot of charm and likability on television today. This is charm. Father Knows Best was charm. That girl was charm. Um, even the murders every week on Alfred Hitchcock Presents, which I do not like, was still charming. It was very charming, likable um, um, essence that was going through each of, of, of the shows on television that we've just lost that. Today. Well, that reminds me that I'm really in the mood for a nice leg of lamb. <laughs> because it's why it's out. No, because of Alfred Hitchcock, Alfred of course. And if you haven't seen it, go watch Alfred Hitchcock Presents, the original stuff. Yeah. 
I really we recommend it. Every time I watch it, it scares me. Every it was time. scary. It was scary. It was scary. And there was no supernaturalness there. We're talking just no. Yeah. Well, look, there were there were there were a few, and we could spend a whole episode talking about the the uh, the 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 one step beyond and outer limits and and all and and Alfred Hitchcock and all these things that are sort of in a similar genre. But the Twilight Zone was just Sorry, a thing. I couldn't quite hear you. Oh shush, Siri. Um, Siri just interrupts all the time. Um, but if you look at the Twilight Zone, and this is this, sure this is the Twilight Zone. <laughs> uh, um, if you think about it, the 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 Twilight Zone was at its best was half an hour. They they stretched it to an hour one year and I'm, one they season. Do. And it was just at its best at, an, at a half an hour because it was literally, it was an O. Henry story. It was like, here's a setup, here's a story, here's the punchline, here's the twist, and move on. And most of the other Twilight Zones have been an hour long, which is, which is I think some of those stories would have been well suited as 10, 15, 20 minutes. Well, as was a, that like the fifth season where they went hour long and then they went back to it? This, yeah, the yeah. fourth, there were five seasons. The fourth season, which did not really appear in syndication, uh, but is available on DVD, uh, went to an hour. And it was just too long. It just, it just, it was like, it was, you know. Have you have you seen the, the half hour gun smokes of the first six years? No, I have not. Un believable amazing stories acting because they don't have to stretch it out what yep. did you just say about the half hour story why is it good because it does what you just said it, something it's a setup good. it's a story it's the punchline and the twist and you're out that's it yeah that's how gun smoke is i totally recommend gun smoke again it fits into the first five years of gun smoke or six years black and white half hours tv noir all right, here we go. Here we go. We're going into the denouement now. Mr. Serling is going to come in in just a moment to give us his uh, his wrap up. And somehow he always managed to work in the words the Twilight Zone. And it was always kind of fun to find how he found his way. Oh, here he's going to bump into a bunch of people. They're going to give him dirty looks. I can't yeah. hear anything. I think it's gone. Isn't that great? Isn't it wonderful? This is, this is, yeah, if this wasn't what landed him bewitched, I don't know what, you know, him, him sitting on, on, on Elizabeth's lap, notwithstanding, this is. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, you know, they say that a Dick Sargent, God bless him, who was a wonderful second Darren, he said that he was a, he was the original choice for Darren. And that is not true. Uh, they always hear. wanted Dick I York to be on that show. And then when the series, when he left the series and he was forced to leave it, really, yeah. then yeah. they went to Dick Sargent. But Dick Sargent said he couldn't do it because he was under contract uh, with Universal to do the Tammy Grimes One show. Second. But all it takes to knock it over is a vagrant breeze, a vibration or a slight blow. Hector B. Poole, a human coin on edge for a brief time in the Twilight Zone. I just, you gotta love the fact that he had that voice, that he had that face, that he had all of that, and and he could write. You know, it's just crazy uh, what how talented this man was. Super talented, super talented, super talented, and and he was just a little guy. I think he was just a maybe a couple five inches. six, yeah, something five, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, us little guys, we gotta stick together. Yeah, baby. <laughs> we look big on TV. I'm wearing my lifts right now. I'm sitting on a phone book. Anybody know what a phone book is? <laughs> okay. Uh, Herbie, really a pleasure talking to you once again. Uh, and I, I look forward to getting you on the show again. We'll, we'll definitely have you on when we talk about Elizabeth Montgomery in two. Looking forward to it. Once again, uh, Herbie J. Pilato. And if you haven't caught then again with Herbie J. Pilato on Amazon Prime or in Amazon UK, let me know if I got that right. Please catch it. He's in his second season. He's had great guests on. I've watched it. I can. This is a man 
who always dreamed of being a talk show host. And uh, trust me when I tell you, he 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 not only achieved his dream, but he he does a good job of it. And uh, and if you love classic television and classic pop culture the way I do, you will want to check out Herbie J's uh, show. And Herbie, uh, as always, great to have you on the show. Thanks so much. Yeah, thank you for all of that. Have a great day, everybody. Stay safe. Take care.